I'd like to invite to the stage Dr. Abbasi to invite our next keynote speaker. So I've said this so many times before, green and white. As a Muslim, green and white. As a, as a Pakistani, green and white. <laughs> And as a Spartan, go, go, <laughs> green and white. So you might be seeing a lot of green and white here, but another interesting piece that I learned that you can take a Pakistani out of Pakistan, but you cannot take Pakistan out of a Pakistan. So I'm really, really honored that we have our visionary leader here, the Council General of Pakistan in Chicago, to support this project, and I invite our Honorable Council General. Dr. Farah Abbasi, Dr. Q, representatives of uh, Michigan State University's University, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. It's, a, it's my great honor and pleasure to join this uh, 15th episode of the Muslim Mental Health Conference and its gala dinner here. And I think this is a great initiative. And I must appreciate the efforts of Dr. Farah Abbasi and all those who contributed in this endeavor. And uh, I think this platform, since it's on a 15th year, played a very crucial role in educating this important cause and bringing this on the forefront. So this is, I think, is a great cause, and we must salute their, their efforts. And thank you very much for your uh, invitation to speak here and to be part of these deliberations, very important deliberations that you just concluded in the conference. Uh, I would briefly talk about the mental health since it's an occasion and uh, Islamic perspective and at the end, as a representative of Pakistan, I would talk about Pakistan and how, how is the mental health there. So mental health, as we know, is, uh, is an essential part of our overall well-being. And we know that it impacts our physical life, uh, our social relationship, work performance. And good health is actually uh, provides us, uh, it allows us to uh, cope with the stresses of life, build relationships, uh, better and to achieve the full potential, whether it is on individual levels or at the national levels or international levels. So I think as we know the mental conditions like uh, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, so many conditions, they, they impact a large sections of uh, society globally. And just I was reading somewhere that anxiety and depression alarms, they cost the global economy more than one trillion US dollars. So I think this not only it's an economic cost, but it's moral obligation that we have. We must strive to, to do, to prioritize mental health and so that we can, we can get a thriving and a healthy uh, society in the world. So I think this, uh, this is very important uh, to continue, but uh, since there is an Islamic perspective here. Uh, this is the Muslim Health Conference. So I think there is a great wisdom in it. Because it is very important to uh, appreciate the fact that Islam has validated the concern about the mental health. And Islam uh, lays emphasis like the uh, physical health on the mental health as well. But we know that there are stigmas, there are stereotypes in the society uh, about the mental health. People sometimes connect it with the weakening of your faith. 
sometimes possessions of jinns and so many. It's, it's all, in all societies. So here, I think we need to understand what Islam, what's the Islam, Islamic perspective here, and what it has been in the history. So basically, I think we know that Islam values the importance of the mental health and uh, well-being, emotional well-being. The Quran is full of verses. I need not to quote so many verses. But so many people use Quran as a guidance for those who are uh, suffering from the mental uh, conditions. And we know that, uh, for example, uh, well before this uh, uh, psychological and psychiatric terms, uh, Quran says, let's say, about nafsi abara, nafsi uh, lavama, nafsi mutmaina, about waswasas, kalb, and uh, I think this all, and this talks about how a human being is related to his Lord. So, there is a much, I think, is a spiritualism that is in the Islamic faith that tells you and it talks about how you should care about others. So I think it, Islam is a, is a moral ethics and all that and this has a special emphasis on that. Similarly, we see, and the long, being the student of history, I can see a long list of Muslims in the golden period of Islam uh, we see hospitals, mental care hospitals in 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th centuries. And they were throughout the Islamic uh, world in different dynasties, you name any dynasty. And you see uh, some uh, brilliant uh, physicians, for example, and uh, philosophers who discussed very in details the contemporary, uh, what, what we know uh, in the contemporary science of psychiatry and the psychology about the mental health a thousand years back and although it could not be continued in that speed, but we know that uh, we, we can name so many and we can just say, for example, al Razi's, uh, Avicenna, we know, uh, Imam Ghazali, I think he is centrality of the cult and then uh, even Avi Rose and so many other philosophers, they wrote so much and their books were, uh, we know that were taught even in, during the Renaissance period in Europe. So I think this, I, I just highlighted these points because this proves that Islam um, lays special emphasis on all uh, type of health in a holistic way, whether it is a physical health, whether it is in a mental health, emotional health, uh, and, and so I think Muslims uh, and other faith believers, I think we have, uh, it's, it's an obligation that we should, we should do something for, for the peoples who are really affected by uh, the mental health condition. So uh, coming now to Pakistan, since as a representative of Pakistan and she also, I'm very thankful to you and your project, I think, is really uh, giving a good name to Pakistans and shows that the Pakistani community along with the broader Muslim community and our friends uh, in the United States and uh, in the university and all, I think they are contributing in this noble cause. And I think we, uh, as Pakistan and the United States, have very close partnerships. They enjoyed since the birth of Pakistan in 1947. And we have so many mechanisms. For example, there is a health dialogue that uh, took place in last uh, July, and that provides for us uh, to discuss these top of issues as well. Similarly, we have a uh, very robust Pakistani-American diaspora here. According to, I estimate it is the one million, ideal uh, the Midwest region, and there is a quarter of a million is here. They are part of the broader Muslim community. And you know, the um, APNA is an organization. There is a one organization. New is about the psychiatry organization as well. And I think uh, Dr. Farah Abbasi initiative itself speaks volume. So I think these all, uh, we can... We do have Pakistan Association of Lancet. And Pakistani Association. I, I must recognize that the community here, they are in a big number. And, and when I talk, just uh, I'm not talking this because I'm in Michigan, but I talk, I'm in Chicago, most of the, my time is there, but I deal 12 states 
uh, including this great state of Michigan, but I always speak high of our community in Michigan, and this sincerely I believe that they are playing a big role. We have also Mr. Asad Malik is sitting here. He's also very active in the community, and so many other peoples in our people. So I know they are, it's, it's not, not just that they are working on the projects. This is working as a whole for the Pakistan-United States relationship and for the people of Pakistan, United States, and for, for the rest of the world as well. Because I know the APNA, for example, it's another uh, physician's organization. They, are, they have so many uh, projects, uh, philanthropic work outside the Pakistan in the United States. So, I think the mental uh, health care is a very important area and I would encourage uh, all uh, of them as well to contribute in this uh, as a partner. And just to briefly talk about Pakistan, uh, Pakistan you know is the fifth largest, uh, is, the most, is the most populous country in the world with 230 million people. So it's a youth population, two thirds of the people are uh, below age of 30. And uh, all the country is just 75 years. It's a very young as compared to the United States, but uh, it is the cradle of the ancient civilization. For example, the Mergar civilization thrived 7,000 years back. And you can imagine so many other uh, civilizations were also uh, thrived there. And uh, just to uh, briefly mention that the situation of mental health care is not different from most of the developing countries. We don't have the sufficient number of psychiatrists in Pakistan to cope with the situation. The government has taken several steps, volunteers and others, but uh, I think there is a lot more uh, need to be done. Especially, I would say, uh, COVID-19, during the COVID-19, uh, Pakistan is often quoted as a success story, even by WHO and others, because it's a smart lockdown policy helped in controlling COVID. But a uh, lot of studies indicate that the mental health cases increased during that period. We were recovering from that, uh, that there, then, then came the last year floods. These were catastrophic uh, climate-induced floods that affected 33 million people and submerged the one-third of the country. So uh, there are reports that one in every five people in the flood affected region is ha having some sort of the mental initiative. So I think these are the challenges, and, but there are opportunities, Pakistan as a youth, Pakistan emerging as a tech cap in the, uh, in the region, and we have some strength as well. And with the partners like uh, for Abbasi, like our uh, uh, Dr. Q, and our representatives here uh, from the Michigan University, Michigan State University, and uh, all of you, I think we, we need to partner. We need to do this as a together. And I would like to see how we can connect you to uh, institutions, for example, academic institutions, universities in Pakistan. They, they, I know they are, I was just checking the University of Karachi, Lahore, and others, they have so many research projects on mental health. So I think we can, we can connect the uh, um, MSU with those and there could be collaboration, not only on the mental health, but broader health and overall initiatives. And at the end, uh, I would just wish you uh, best health, uh, all holistic health, physical, mental, and all, and we should uh, reiterate our commitment to take care of those who need the mental health care, and we should be, we should see as a sympathetic way, and we should, as a caring way, and as a human way. Thank you again for your invitation, and I would just again like to uh, laud all of your efforts, and we are with you. Thank you so much. The reason I especially had the Council General from Pakistan here, because under the Muslim Mental Health Conference, we, we have established Global Mental Health Conference as well. And part of it is, uh, again, these 30 countries that I talk about, a lot of that work we, are, we have started in these countries, including Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey, Jordan, 
and Michigan State has memorandum of understanding. And the idea is capacity building and developing infrastructure. And recently we met with the Pakistan, uh, Pakistan's president to develop uh, mental health uh, infrastructure and uh, impact uh, support the policies there. And the good news, two good news, two achievements that I especially am very proud as a Spartan to talk about, that we were able to decriminalize society in Pakistan. I have a great team of uh, Papana here, Pakistan Association psychiatrists here, and we were also able to get Suboxone approved in Pakistan. This conference would be incomplete if we did not acknowledge who we affectionately call the mother of mental health conversations in the Muslim community. Please stand, Dr. Anissa Nadir. So to talk about that a little bit more, I'd like to welcome to the stage Brother Omar Khan, the co-founder and CEO of Room. Our vision really is to help improve the Muslim like mental health from an Islamic lens and a mental health lens. And our goal is to do, do that by leveraging technology, by really driving the Muslim mental health space forward by using technology to make it accessible. And we do that today by our two solutions. So one is the app itself, so the Room app. It's available on the App Store, it's available in the Play Store. It really started in the pandemic because, you know, like many people, I was going through my own mental health challenges. Didn't really find anything to connect. So I was like, let's go to the App Store. Let's find something to cope up with. And when I went there, I found Headspace and found Calm, like a lot of meditation apps. Tried it out, but didn't fully resonate with me. Benefited me a little bit, but didn't fully connect. Like Reverend was saying earlier, the cultural sensitivity wasn't there. The, the faith aspect was missing. So that's when we spoke with chaplains, we spoke with Muslim professionals, didn't find any solution. So that's when we started working on Rook as a project. And so this app is an Islamic mindfulness app to help you reduce anxiety, stress, and help you live a more meaningful life, grounded in Islam, at the same time integrating tools and techniques from psychology. And Whenever we would be at different events, like in the mosques and you know, conferences and so on, we would, come, we would have people come up to, the, to us and ask, do you connect us with the Muslim therapist in the app? They're, it's actually nice to see that because people are willing to now get support, which is amazing. But you know, oftentimes we advocate for our community to receive us double support. We tell them to go get therapy. But when it comes to actually finding a therapist that you can, you know, you're aligned with, that you can relate to, you, that you can connect with, it's hard to do so. And so that's why we also started building a directory called Ruh Care, which is a global directory of Muslim therapists in partnership with many Muslim organizations that are in the audience today as well. Institute of Muslim Mental Health, FIA Institute, Peaceful Family Projects, and many more coming together to unify the directory efforts that were being made. So Alhamdulillah today, Ruh Care is now the largest global directory of Muslim therapists with over 500 Muslim therapists in the US, UK, Canada, and Europe. Alhamdulillah. So now, finding a Muslim therapist is li literally one search away, inshallah. Wow. And Alhamdulillah, as we you know, uh, are honoring our legacy at this 15 Muslim Mental Health Conference, as we are reflecting on our progress together, and as we are envisioning this new future, we're very ecstatic to actually announce as well, last year, we were at the conference in our beta stage, just testing the idea out, right, and just experimenting. And I left the conference energized, Inspired by so many amazing leaders that we have in the space, you know, definitely so many amazing, you know, the research that's being put out, the publications, the books, the, the, the studies that are being done, and that just inspired us and kept us driving even more. So today, on the 11th of March, 2023, not only are we celebrating the 15th annual Muslim Mental Health Conference of Success, but it's also our, inshallah, official launch for Ru. So inshallah, as we, you know, in the future, maybe five years from now, ten years from now, when you look back at this, inshallah, this is a historic moment to look at. Next year is the digital mental health theme, so that will be exciting, inshallah. Love to see all of you there. And inshallah, please keep us in your duas. That's all we can ask for at the moment. And 
if there's something we can help with, you know, to serve your community, let us know. And inshallah, we are very, very excited to build a more accessible Muslim mental health future together. Yeah. Uh, so.